Hello, this is Mark Tooley, president of the Institute on Religion and Democracy and editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy, with the pleasure today of speaking with Joel Rosenberg, best-selling author, uh, speaker, analyst of Mideast Affairs, uh, speaking to us today, I believe, from Jerusalem, although he can yes. correct you if I'm wrong. And uh, I'm going to ask him most especially about the uh, latest uh, dramatic diplomatic breakthrough between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, uh, but also a little bit about his overall work in the Middle East and uh, what motivates him theologically. So Joel, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Great to, uh, to see you at least uh, virtually and uh, from half a world away, but uh, joy meeting at the State Department, been following your work for a while and uh, look forward to seeing you either in Washington or I say next year in Jerusalem, because I'm not sure it's going to be this year. We'll, we'll see how the <laughs> right. COVID thing plays out, but it's certainly wreaked havoc so far. So keep, keep praying not just for the peace, but the health of Jerusalem. Yes, absolutely. Well, I didn't do justice to your uh, bio, but give us just a few uh, more details about your background, if you could. Well, Mark, I'm a failed political consultant. I noticed that you didn't mention that. Um, that's actually what I did for the first uh, years of my professional career. Um, uh, I helped a lot of people lose their elections. Uh, and uh, they may have done well years after they got, you know, away from me, but, you know, I, I wasn't much help. So, and that includes a series of U.S. and um, Israeli officials, uh, including the, the current prime minister, uh, Netanyahu, whom I worked for 20 years ago. Um, haven't seen him personally in 10, so uh, you can draw whatever conclusion you want from that. But I was part of his comeback campaign team uh, back in the year 2000, late in the, in the fall. And as anyone who follows his career knows, he was uh, checkmated from running at that time. It took him nine years to come back after <laughs> nine years, more years, and I played no role whatsoever. So I shifted from uh, political work, uh, mostly in communications and messaging, uh, into making things up for a living. And I became a novelist, uh, writing political thrillers, um, many of them Middle East based, uh, not all of them, but most of them, uh, and weaving my faith in uh, as I felt was appropriate and trying to uh, raise some spiritual themes as well as uh, war and terror and <laughs> mayhem and, uh, but you know, um, and, uh, and more recently, uh, well, well, uh, two last things, I guess, uh, 14 years ago, my wife and I uh, established a nonprofit uh, organization in the United States called the Joshua Fund. Uh, this is a ministry to educate and mobilize Christians in North America and all over the world to bless Israel, but also her neighbors in the name of Jesus. And over the years, uh, this ministry has invested more than $50 million in humanitarian relief, uh, Holocaust survivors, uh, Syrian and Iraqi refugees, uh, strengthening churches, um, pastor training and equipment and encouragement here in Israel, in the Palestinian territory and in five neighboring Arab countries, uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq to the east and, um, and Egypt to the south. So I uh, founded that, was the president for many years, and then a number of years ago shifted to be the chairman, and I've got a great team um, who runs that. Um, and then more recently, actually uh, right now, uh, on September 1st, uh, we are going to launch uh, two new websites. Uh, one's called All Israel News, and one is called All Arab News. And uh, what there really isn't, oh, there's a lot of great websites and news systems out there, although there's a lot of bad ones too, but there's not really a one-stop shopping site or sites that not only link to all the most interesting, incredible news in the region, but also then pro also provides original reporting, exclusive interviews, polling, and trying to provide context from an evangelical Christian perspective. So all Israel news, all Arab news, September 1st. And uh, if I recall correctly, uh, you had a spiritual conversion uh, after your political life and preceding your uh, entrance into life as a uh, writer? Well, uh, well, I came to faith at the age of eight years old, actually. Um, uh, I had, let's say, um, a spiritual wrestling uh, when I, you know, when I came to the end of my failed political life and I was like, 
you know, Lord, um, I think this is what I was supposed to be doing. I've learned a lot, but I've been no use to anybody. Um, what do you want me to do with the rest of my life? I don't, I, I don't want to help people lose. I, I want to make a difference. And, um, and I think I really processed that, wrestled that through. Although I'll tell you, Mark, I'm one of the few Jewish people that was born and raised in the United States that did not get the financial gene. I'm not your accountant, your stockbroker, your hedge fund manager, nor am I a doctor, a lawyer, or the head of a movie company. I sort of didn't get the classic Jewish skill sets, though I am Jewish on my father's side, Gentile on my mom's side. But yeah, I really decided by going into the field of making things up, uh, uh, the, the political thrillers, that I, I needed to be free to say whatever I wanted, and more importantly, what I thought God wanted me to say. Um, I had to be able to compete with the best of the best on the New York Times bestseller list and the other major lists. I, I had to really thrill people as I wrote. I, you know, it can't be a trap. But, you know, political thrillers deal with death and the fear of death. And nobody in the Tom Clancy books that I used to read or others ever seemed to care. I mean, nobody wanted to die. But, you know, there's, I think, a lot of spiritual uh, themes that come up in um, in the lives of people who put their lives on the line every day, intelligence, security, military, uh, so forth. So uh, I've been trying to do that. It, it's, it's challenging, I'll just say, that uh, it's challenging to compete against everybody else and not have um, sexual content like other people do, not have the language, and then try organically in the story to have at least some level of a spiritual engagement, at least with some characters, um, you know, I don't want to see, make it seem weird, but I do want it to be organic as I think it is in life. Um, and that has opened up an entirely new world, Mark, for me. Uh, first, you know, you don't expect your novel even to do well, right? You just hope when you write your first novel that your mother can find it at a bookstore within a hundred miles of your house. That's sort of your objective. <laughs> Anything beyond that is a little, you know, has a little bit of chutzpah with it. Uh, but then if you're trying to also engage people in what really is happening in Israel and the Middle East and how does it affect Americans and Canadians and others, can you also engage them somehow spiritually? And uh, that's not the easiest uh, needle to thread. I'm not saying I've done it right uh, all the time or maybe any of the time, but um, that is what I've been doing for almost 20 years. And uh, I'll be going back you know, into more journalism also with all Israel news and all Arab news. but uh, it's been a fascinating journey to see what type of doors have opened. Who is, who are reading these books and, and, and what, uh, what kind of conversations can you be involved with either personally or in the media or at various events that actually do engage faith, geopolitics, um, national security, foreign policy, Right. These are the things and Mark, you know, you grew up, I'm sure, like I did with everybody telling you, you know, you never talk about religion and politics. And of course, I've spent my entire career <laughs> doing at least one and then now last 20 years, both. And I think it can be done. And I don't recommend it to everyone, but I, um, it's, it's, it's central to who I am, both of those things. Well, please tell us uh, your thoughts on uh, the Israel uh, UAE uh peace and uh, diplomatic deal. Obviously, it's been years uh, in the making, and Iran has been the unintentional friend of this uh, rapprochement between uh, Persian Gulf states uh, and Israel. But uh, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, both as an American and as an Israeli, I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. Uh, it means I get to vote twice. Uh, it's like, like voting in Chicago, you know. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, I'm thrilled, and is Israelis are ecstatic. Uh, because we haven't had an Arab-Israeli peace deal um, in almost 26 years. The last uh, peace treaty was with the Kingdom of Jordan, uh, 1994, uh, October of 94. And before that, you have to go back to 1979, the original peace deal between um, Egyptian President Anwar el-Sadat and then Israeli Prime Minister Menachem Begin. So all three are huge. And the fact that we haven't seen one in almost, you know, more than a quarter of a century is a game changer. This is a big deal. And uh, it's interesting because uh, sort of a personal angle on it, Mark, um, almost two years ago, the crown prince of the United Arab Emirates, 
uh, a gentleman by the name of Sheikh Mohammed uh, bin Zayed, uh, commonly known in the region as MBZ. Uh, he invited me to bring a delegation of American evangelical Christians to come visit him. I had been doing that. I'd been invited by the King of Jordan, uh, King Abdullah, to uh, bring such a delegation to him, and we had done that. Uh, President El Sisi had invited me to bring a delegation, and we've actually led two uh, to see him and uh, his top people, as well as Christians in both of those countries and Muslims. Uh, but both of those countries, uh, for, for the Egyptians, it was the first time they'd ever invited uh, evangelicals to meet with a president, as far as the palace knew, ever. Um, obviously, Jesus was in uh, Egypt in his uh, young childhood, but I, we, and, and there were certainly many Christians in Egypt. But, but in terms of evangelicals meeting with a, a, an Egyptian president, they were not aware that ever happened, and, and they touted it as the first ever. King Abdullah had done these things in the past, though very low key, but the United Arab Emirates had never done it, and that's why they wanted to do it. Obviously, you know, a few months after we were there in October of 2018, uh, then in early 2019, uh, they brought um, His Holiness uh, Pope Francis, first time that a, a Roman Catholic uh, pontiff had, had set foot on, um, on the Arabian Peninsula, aside from Iraq, but really in, the, in a Gulf state. That was big. We were first, and I'll just say uh, very quickly that we had a, a four days in the country almost and uh, met with a, just a wide range of leaders, including local Christian leaders. And um, there are more than 700 uh, Christian churches freely operating. I wouldn't say with full freedom of, uh, of religion, I would say with freedom of worship. Uh, there are some restrictions, cultural and, and uh, some legal. But we had two hours with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Zayed. And what was off the record at the time was that he told us flat out, Joel, I am ready to make peace with Israel. We were stunned. And that led to a very robust conversation about why and what would that look like and what's the roadmap for you all between here and whenever you, you get there. Um, it was a fascinating conversation. So. I've maintained very close working ties with all of his inner circle, or a lot of his inner circle, including the UAE ambassador to Washington, Yusuf al Taiba, whom I met with twice uh, in uh, Washington last month, and, uh, and multiple calls and multiple texts, and especially as we were getting ready for this all Arab news, I wanted all the Arab ambassadors that I had worked with to know that we were getting ready to launch this, as well as all Israel news, and uh, it was clear with each call that something big was brewing. He didn't give the full, he didn't give away the full thing, but he took me right up to the line and it was fairly easy to deduce what they were about to do. My sense of it was, in terms of timing, was that it was gonna be later in the fall, maybe October. Um, so I was surprised that it happened now, but, um, but thrilled, I think it's a huge breakthrough. So sorry that was a more long-winded answer than I had intended, but. Um, it's been an interesting front row seat. We played no role really, but, but as having a front row seat to the unfolding of a new major chapter of history, uh, as a, specifically as an evangelical, not even so much as a novelist, certainly not as a failed political consultant, mm -hmm. but as a follower of Jesus, uh, that has been amazing and, uh, and, and, uh, humbling. And what is the overall uh, motivation for the UAE for potentially, uh, other Persian Gulf states to follow this path? Well, I think uh, you're asking what's, what's the UAE's motivation or the motivation of others? Well, the, starting with the UAE. Well, I think the UAE made a strategic decision a number of years ago, uh, well, several strategic decisions. First, uh, they made a decision right at 9-11 that they were gonna be not with bin Laden, they were gonna be with the United States. And they made a decision uh, very quickly um, to dispatch troops to Afghanistan and to engage uh, the enemy, uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda. That was a big deal for an Arab Muslim country uh, to be fighting against Muslims. Um, and, in, and many of them were Arab Muslims, not all. Obviously, there's other ethnicities in Afghanistan, but that was a big deal. Um, that was a strategic decision not to do what Arabs had done, Arab states had done for many years, which is look, we want to sell you oil. 
we want you to defend us if we're threatened by Saddam Hussein or whomever, but we don't really want a close relationship. We want a standoffish, you know, you stay over there, we'll stay over here. Um, and, and Israel's alliance with the United States was part of that, to be honest. But they made a decision to change that. Then they made a series of other decisions. And uh, they've tried to make a much, a, a very high tech, um, high finance, modern, um, I wouldn't say Western country, but a modern 21st century high tech uh, country. It's a trading country. You know, 88% of the people that live in the United Arab Emirates are foreigners. They're foreign workers who are, you know, only 12% of the population are actual Emiratis with citizenship. Everybody else is a foreigner working there. So that plus all the trade that comes in and out of their ports has made them need to be more connected to the world and wanting to be more tolerant, even if they have major theological and political and foreign policy differences with, you know, their neighbors, with us and so forth. So, but they, if they wanted to move down that, that path. And I'll just say that they have kept taking steps that have been very significant. And, um, and I think when they got to a point where it's going to be an anniversary year, you know, it's the youngest of all the Arab states, uh, only receiving its independence from the British in the early 1970s. And they were going to have a big year of a celebration of the founder, Sheikh, Sheikh bin Zayed, the father of the current crown prince. And, um, and they decided to name that the year of tolerance. Uh, this was 2019. And so we were one of the projects. They decided, let's, let's show that we have churches, like the Saudis do not. Uh, we have um, we have good relationships with evangelicals and Catholics and and other uh, streams of Christianity, but we haven't actually invited them ever at a leadership level. They operate, they they do business here, they minister here, whatever. But so an evangelical delegation and 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 Pope Francis, like um, I mean, as you know, that one of the challenges with evangelicalism, at least in the modern age, is we don't really have. We, first of all, we don't have a pope, but second of all, we don't have Billy Graham anymore. He was the ambassador of evangelicalism for you know half a century or more. So, so now it's all much more diffuse. So, who would you invite? I don't know why they decide to invite an Israeli, American, Jewish evangelical with two sons who served in the Israeli army, including one right now. You know. As I told the crown prince, you could throw a dart out the window in America and tap any one of those other 60 million evangelicals to lead a delegation such as this. But, but I think they were, again, sending a message. Uh, and they were, they were baby stepping, but these were not, I wouldn't even say this baby stepping. They were taking significant steps, obviously bringing the Pope and not just secretly, quietly, handshake. They gave him the biggest stadium in the country and said, fill it and have a mass, like, that's extraordinary. Um, I don't know if they would have invited Billy Graham to hold a crusade. First of all, they wouldn't have called it a crusade. That would have been one problem. <laughs> the actual invitation to receive Christ from whatever background, I'm not sure they're ready to sort of endorse that yet. But again, these are big steps. So um, they don't want to be lumped in with the lunatics. They've made their choices. They pursue a, a moderate form of Islam. They're devout, but they don't intend to um, let themselves be fed as radicals or extremists. And they're concerned, as I think many Arab leaders are, that American governments might get them, but the American people do not. And they have to, and I agree with them. They, I've told them, you really need to do a much better job engaging with the American people, not just Washington. And as you note on your Twitter feed uh, this morning, the Saudis are um, initially uh, critical of the UAE-Israel breakthrough, but uh, possibly are laying the groundwork for their own breakthrough, you suggest. Well, I haven't seen direct criticism. I think my tweets indicate that they are not, they have not indicated that they're changing their own position or, or somehow rushing forward to give a bear hug to this process. I think the, the stakes are the highest for the Saudis. So now I, we also went at the invitation of arguably the most uh, controversial leader in the world, uh, certainly in the top five, let's say, if you add Putin and uh, the 
leader, the dear leader of Saudi or of, of uh, North Korea. I mean, if you add Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman into the mix of some of the most controversial leaders in the world, um, he's invited me twice to bring evangelical delegations. Once in November of 2018, but then he invited us back again in September of 2019. So some of that was off the record, uh, certainly as regards to Israel. But I can say that I sense that there's, I mean, we can all see it in, 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 in the reporting, what's going on in the region. There is a warming towards Israel and towards the Jewish people, bringing in a Jew, an Israeli, okay, and even juggle, but still, it's even more sensitive for the Saudis. They are taking baby steps. They, uh, again, for them, it's actually, you know, one small step for man, but one giant leap for the Saudi kingdom. Like, these are big steps. Uh, the crown prince has indicated that he believes Israel has every right to be a secure state in the region. But they're not going to lurch into normalization. Um, they have, because the stakes are very high. They are the, the epicenter, right, of Mecca, Medina. Um, Islamism, historically, meaning political Islam, Sunni. Uh, and I think they, I, I sense that they want to move in this direction, but they, they've got a population that is um, much more conservative um, because they've made it conservative. I mean, they, you know, my term, not there, but they poisoned the well with anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, anti-Israelism for so long, it's going to take some time to, to steer that ship differently. I think if you look at Bahrain, Oman, Morocco, some of these other countries are much more likely in the near term. I don't want to predict how near, but uh, but I've got conversations with all of them, and I'm I think they they also could go down this road. Um, I think the Saudis will get there. I wrote a political thriller that's out this year called The Jerusalem Assassin. That's about a Saudi leader coming to Jerusalem for a major peace summit with the Israelis, as long as it was hosted by the American president, but then all the bad guys come out of the woodwork to try to blow the thing up. So I, I know they've read the book at the top level, so maybe, maybe I've slowed down their process. I don't think so. I think I'm reflecting they've got a lot of things to weigh, and they've got to have a strategy to, uh, to move forward step by step. And Joe, finally, uh, it's fair to say you are pr preeminently a man of hope, and I assume that you are overall hopeful for the future of the Middle East. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I will tell you, Mark, that as a Russian Jew, uh, I, I, my, my natural bearing is to be a worst case scenario uh, thinker, uh, to see the world as a, 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 the glass is not only half empty, but cracked and leaking. So that's naturally the way I see the world. Uh, but as a believer in Christ, with the Holy Spirit within me, um, yes, I am hopeful ultimately. But I will tell you that I, I, I see the next few months and few years as I think we're going to see more peace agreements. However, I also see darkness, um, and I think it's split between East and West. To the West, you have the U.S., Israel, Sunni, Arab alliance is emerging. But to the east, you have Russia, Iran, Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood, Qatar is sort of playing both sides of the fence. Uh, it's a problem, and it's going to be a clash. Uh, and it's something we're going to have to negotiate, navigate our way through, both as Americans and as Israelis. So hopefully, yes, and ultimately Christ will come and make it all right, and he'll reign from right down the street here in Jerusalem. Looking forward to that. In the meantime, we as followers of Christ need to realize that a lot of our brothers and sisters are, have struggled to, tremendously in this region and continue to, whether it's the genocide of ISIS, uh, the, the horror show of, uh, of being under Hezbollah, Iranian occupation under, uh, in, in Lebanon, um, uh, under uh, Hamas occupation in Gaza. I mean, you know, having no freedom to open up a church legally in Saudi Arabia, there's all, there's a lot of challenges in this part of the world. It's a messy neighborhood, but there are movements now, the last few years, that are very encouraging. And I'll just, maybe I'll end with this one. You know, there's a lot of challenges for Coptic Christians in Egypt. And uh, I believe a lot of progress is made, but there's a lot more that has to be made. Um, and if you talk to American Coptic Christians, they're, they are not as uh, 
warm and encouraged by the reforms that Egyptian President el-Sisi has made than by some, and I would think many, in my, my perception, Egyptian Coptic believers. But again, decisions made at the top don't always filter down in a country of 100 million people. But just as one example, the Egyptian president built a church, uh, the largest in the Middle East, and gifted it to the Egyptian Coptic Christian population on Eastern Orthodox Christmas Eve last year. Uh, president El-Sisi invited me to bring a, a delegation to be part of that, to be there at the opening. We, we did, we thanked him. Uh, we met with dozens and dozens of uh, Egyptian Christians, both Protestant and um, uh, Coptic Orthodox. These are moments of progress, but they don't solve all the problems. So we need to keep uh, understanding what's going on in the Arab Muslim world, of course, in Israel. And again, that's one of the reasons uh, that I'm launching this new, uh, these two new websites, uh, All Israel News, All Arab News, to, again, to link to articles that you're writing. I mean, we're going to write original stuff and do original interviews, but I feel like there's not a one-stop shopping place that drives more people to what you're writing and, and what Johnny Moore is writing and, and, and others who are evangelicals who, who have a heart for both sides of this conflict, m multiple sides of the conflict, uh, but not enough people, in my view, um, exactly know where to find those voices and to understand what's happening and why it matters and, and how to pray differently and maybe more focusedly uh, than they have in the past. Joel Rosenberg, author and uh, analyst of Mideast Affairs, uh, thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Mark. Next year in uh, Washington or Jerusalem. Absolutely. Thank you.